Got another question for the enthalpy and entropy walkthrough playlist. So we're on to number 15 now. There's a lot going on in this question. So we've got a calorimetry question. We've got an enthalpy change of formation calculation. We've then got to move on to the Gibbs equation and it finishes with feasibility of reactions. I hope you liked the video and if you haven't already subscribed, why don't you think about subscribing to the channel? As always, the link to the questions in the description of the video if you want to try it first. Okay, so make a start. So it's a calorimetry question this. We've got to calculate the maximum temperature reached by the reaction. So we're going to need to calculate delta T from Q over MC. Once we know that, we can add that on to the starting temperature and that will give us the maximum temperature reached. So the tricky bit really with the question is calculating the Q value we need to use. We've obviously got M, the mass of the solution is 100 grams because it was a 100 cm cubed of solution and the specific heat capacity we're told to be the same as that for water so it's 4.18. So what we've got to do is scale this delta H value down to the number of moles used in the experiment. So the first thing we need to appreciate is the equation, the reaction uses two moles of silver nitrate. So we need to half this. So that comes out at minus 339 kilojoules. And then we just need to work out how many moles of silver nitrate were actually used in the experiment. So that's gonna be concentration times volume. So 0.04 moles of silver nitrate were used. So all we need to do now is multiply the moles by the number of kilojoules released per mole. So that comes out at 13.56 kilojoules, but remember in the Q equals MC delta T equation, Q is in joules. So we need to multiply by 1,000 to get that into joules. So when we divide those joules by the MC, so 100 times 4.18, we get 32.44 degrees C. Remember that's the temperature change. So we need to add 20 degrees onto that to get the maximum temperature reached. And just be careful, you make sure you give your final answer to three significant figures. And this final bit of the first part of the question, so we've got to appreciate that the student's only using half the number of moles as before. So that means half of the energy will be released as before, but importantly, it's only heating up half the volume, half the mass of solution. So we're only using 50 cm cubed this time rather than 100. So half the energy, heating half the mass, the temperature rise will be the same. Part B, so the enthalpy change of formation question. Start with the definition, which we've just got to remember. Enthalpy change when one mole of a compound is formed from its elements. It doesn't say standard enthalpy change of formation, so we don't have to bring in the standard conditions. So moving on to the calculation, you can see in the table we've got enthalpy change of formation values. So when you use an enthalpy change of formation, the enthalpy change for a reaction is calculated using this formula here. So it's the enthalpy change of formation of the product minus the reactants. So we'll put the numbers in. The delta H for the reaction is minus 1172. So the enthalpy change of formation of the products so there's that unknown one we've got to calculate. So four times that, I'll just call it X, plus the six H2O enthalpy change of formation. So add all them together and subtract from that the four enthalpy change of formation for ammonia. And obviously oxygen's an element, so it doesn't have an enthalpy change of formation value. So that right-hand side tidies up to 4X minus 1532. So we get 4X on its own, we get that which gives us 4x equals 360. So we just divide by four now to get the enthalpy change of formation for the NO. And the only thing really to bear in mind here is enthalpy changes must have um, a sign. So it's either positive or negative. Obviously this one's positive. So moving on to part C, it starts with a, another definition, explain the term entropy. So that's a measure of the disorder, or you could say the dispersal energy in a chemical system. Uh, moving on to the calculation, so we've got to calculate delta H for this reaction. So it's all based on the Gibbs equation, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. So we'll just rearrange for delta H. 
So there's that there. We've got delta G, there it is there. We've got the temperature, 25 degrees C, but remember that's got to be in Kelvin. So what we've got to do next is calculate delta S from these entropy values. So delta S is calculated by taking the entropies of the products minus the entropies of the reactants. I refer to this as the SPAR equation. Just help me remember which way around the P and the R go. So delta S comes out at plus 284 joules per Kelvin per mole. So now we can put the numbers into the delta H expression, the one I mentioned a minute ago. Just be careful here. Remember the temperature's got to be in Kelvin, but because the delta G is in kilojoules per mole, we've got to convert the delta S into kilojoules effectively. So we've got to divide this by a thousand. So that's why it's 0 0.284 there. So delta H comes out at minus 2587 kilojoules per mole. And finally, is this student correct to say that reaction 17.2 is feasible at all temperatures? Well, it's all based on the Gibbs equation. Um, so for a reaction to be feasible at a particular temperature, delta G has to be negative. So what about this reaction here? Well, we've calculated delta H is negative. Got that there. Temperature is always positive and we calculated delta S to be positive up here. So effectively, you're combining two negative terms here because that minus sign will stay a minus sign. So you combine an, a negative delta H with a negative T delta S. So delta G will always be negative, so the student was correct.